A black swan is lurking around the corner, waiting to make itself known to the world, tearing through everything in its path, eviscerating our definition of normal and causing a schism in between the present and the past. Corporations, now bigger than entire nations, could bring these countries to their knees, leaving politicians at their wit's end. Always be prepared. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today we will discuss this Eurobank revealing four possible black swan events for 2017. Let's get into it right away. It's an article out of Reuters, and it discussed so much. I really wanted to cover several points from it and thought that it would do well if I really gave it some attention, showed it to you, and made it as brief as possible. Peaks, black swans, and bonanzas, market tips, bold calls, and eye catchers for 2017. I want to say right off the bat that I don't agree with everything in here, but it covered so much information that I do believe is important that I wanted to bring it to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to cover um, a bunch of points from it. Let's start right at the top here. Politics, economics, and finance have all been turned on their head for 2016. Investors are already looking at the 2017. So here we are looking at 2017. What they think for 2016 is that in December, the Federal Reserve will uh, increase interest rates. We can expect there to be stimulus and other things, and I'll cover that in a moment. And essentially, this is very crucial. This will be sort of that mode and method for 2017. So use that as the theme as I continue on here. The consensus, not my consensus, is that a 35-year bull market and bonds is over. Inflation is back. Central banks are maxed out for the first time in a decade. Any stimulus to the global economy will now come from governments. I'll stop there just for a moment. We don't know if the bond, uh, bull market and bonds is over. Uh, ultimately, when you're selling uh, negative yield on things, to me, it, it seems like it was over a long time ago in that respect. When you have inflation back, I mean, you're, you don't calculate inflation properly to begin with. So this is sort of convoluted. And essentially, the central banks are maxed out. They were maxed out a long time ago during the financial crisis, in fact. So to suggest now, now that we're turning to governments, they ran TARP. They ran all of these other schemes years ago. They, they are maxed out. So it's not, you know, take it with a grain of salt. The implications for markets to appear further increases in bond yields developed world stocks and the dollar. While emerging market currencies, stocks and bonds are expected to struggle under the weight of higher U.S. bond yields. So generally what they're saying here is look to the blue chips, look to the developed nations and you know those um, sort of up and coming, either corporations, countries, anything, may struggle during these times. In equities, developed markets are favored, emerging, uh, over emerging, cyc cyclical sectors over defensive. Banks are expected to benefit from steepening bond yield curves. Infrastructure spending could boost housing and construction stocks and we already saw that uh, with home depot that's the consensus and essentially saying let's look at some other things number one bond yields to fall there's some predictions in here i don't really care about uh, these particular predictions then what i would say here is that they're all betting on the federal reserve increasing interest rates Peak 2016, Bank of America saw peak 2016, saw peak liquidity, peak inequality, peak globalization, peak deflation. This is really stupid. And the end of the biggest ever bull market in bonds. That all starts to reverse next year for the first time since 2006. There will be no big easing of monetary policy in the G7 and interest rates and inflation will surprise to the upside. You know, we could... That just doesn't seem that like the game that they're playing ultimately. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. And I mean, they are definitely doing things behind the scenes, but we're talking about publicly in front of our eyes. Then we get into, right here, the black swans. Economists at Society General illustrate a graphic with four black swans, and it discusses that. Look at this. 
a flip there and flip back. You're seeing this curve here. Two things I want to note. The bigger the swan is, the bigger the impact it has. And also the higher it up it is, then would be the higher percentage uh, here. Number one, isolation and trade wars, that's 15%. China hard landing, 20%. Sharp increase in bond yields, 25%. Political uncertainty drag, 30%. And you're looking at the probability here, the percentage, just to be clear. These things here, not one of them is explicitly saying war. Political uncertainty, is that what it's called? Trade wars? Maybe that's talking about it. I'm talking about war. I'm talking about battling. Countries battling against each other, whether it's a proxy war, whether it's a direct war. Why is that not being discussed? The escalation of which perhaps has been stifled to some degree with Trump's election. But it is not over, absolutely not over. And there are so many things that could hit that spark and we have a big war. Let me move on quickly before this video gets too long. So I'll just finish off with the uh, four black swans. That There are more than four black swans. I even referred to before as the nuke effect. What they can't prepare for. A black swan... The term is so abused. If anyone's ever read Nassim's, Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, it's not something that happens once every five years. A black swan is an event that nobody is prepared for. We're talking about events that, you know, lifetimes could go by and nothing happens. So that's a true black swan event. And be prepared for that to happen, of course. The euro also rises. The dollar is overvalued versus other G10 currencies. Not something you hear too often, but it's the view of Swiss wealth managing giant UBS. They predict the euro will end next year at 120, going against growing calls for parity. And, you know, it's practically at par right now. So I would suggest that there is some changes, if this happens, some big changes that need to happen in this time frame. The euro will also draw support for the ECB tapering its QE. Undervalued sterling will pick itself up from its Brexit mauling to rally against the greenback. So they're suggesting basically that after all this Brexit talk, the uh, sterling happened to weaken the pound and uh, essentially will come back up from that. The ECB is going to taper off. I don't know how. It's going to taper off its QE. Does anybody think that's going to happen? The good carry in EM, few dis uh, dispute that higher dollar and U.S. yields will hurt emerging markets. And this here is something that emerging markets generally, when you're looking for better yield, you tend to go to emerging markets or just riskier bets in general. That's why I tend to perhaps disagree with this is that all of these hedge funds, all of these different investment companies, they are looking for ways to increase their profits and they'll go to the emerging markets. They'll take those risks on the junk bonds. They'll take risks in corporations that maybe, you know, they're a little bit far off and they'll invest in that hoping for the best. More QE from the ECB. Inflation has bottomed out. The Fed is raising rates and other central banks are beginning to reduce their stimulus. The ECB will taper its $80 billion, uh, a month program, right? Well, I'm in agreement with this. The fact that they're saying, how can they ever, how can they ever taper back at this time? They're even in a worse situ situation in the near term than the Fed is with the U.S., and let's just read their uh, lies and quotes here. Even toward the end of 2017, the discussion will be very similar to that is seen at the present. How can the ECB continue to stimulate the economy? Well, don't print money. That's not a good way to stimulate the economy. It's just really silly. It's really childish. But that's the way the Keynesians like to think. $1 trillion U.S. earnings bonanza. How much offshore earnings can the U.S. companies bring back to... Bring back if President-elect Trump follows through with his pledge to cut corporate tax about $1 trillion. 
And they're talking about giving a boost to stocks, giving a boost to the economy in general, and essentially bringing in more taxes by doing this, uh, cutting corporate tax. I think it could bring in some. I just think that corporations may decide to continue to leave that money overseas. They're always going to search for a way to take their money, whether it's overseas or they wash it clean through one of these you know, Panama corporations or anything else, wash the money clean and bring it back in and invest it in something else. This happens all the time and it doesn't cease to amaze me when we have things like this where Trump brings it to light and all of a sudden, you know, it's seen as something that's new that, oh, they just started doing this. This has been going on for so long. It's nothing new here. And overall, what I would say here is that we have many uncertain things about 2017 coming up. Will the Fed raise rates? If they do raise rates, are they going to do it in any significant manner? Are they actually going to be able to increase inflation in Europe? Are they going to be able to stem the deflation that is occurring in wages in the U.S., for example? Are they going to be able to calm the U.S. housing markets in area areas like, for example, San Francisco, Manhattan, where you have these heated markets and people can't afford it and more people are turning over to renting but the rent prices are going up as a result at the same time you have electricity prices rising you had food prices rising at the same time so you have deflation in some areas you have inflation in other areas and then you look to uh, something like venezuela which is completely rotten unfortunately really sad and they have uh, full control over the economy full control over the economy and what happens there and look at the disaster. You have approximately 700% inflation, completely destroying people. Menus are printed on pieces of paper because they can't keep up with it. They can't print on uh, some sort of something that would last uh, quite a while there with the prices. It's printed on a piece of paper, and every day they just update that. That's where we are heading in most countries. Not just with inflation, but it can happen with deflation. It could happen in various methods I've talked here before. What I would suggest to everyone is to be prepared. Lessen your dependence on this system. If food is too expensive, find a way to get it cheaper, whether that's growing it in your own garden, whether that's growing sprouts indoors, whether that is finding a way to buy foods in bulk, to use storable foods, to choose different types of foods which are locally sourced, anything. There are many different ways to uh, get into this and uh, you know it's not the topic for this video but I do like to mention that because people are always looking for solutions every single day so I hope you do appreciate that. If you found this video informative please give me a thumbs up. When you give me a thumbs up it helps this channel it helps me to basically be exposed to the YouTube world to Google as well so I do appreciate that very much. Last but not least if you found the video informative you're going to find my book, The Money GPS, even more informative. I have diagrams. I have all sorts of charts that will help anybody at any level. So check it out. If you go over to Amazon where they have a look inside feature, it's going to allow you to flip through the pages of the book and see if you like it. Take care.